evening, everyone. We're back to having our little clippy mic. Alan's got me set up on a new camera, so we're going to see how that works out. And I'm going to talk today about Ventru and doing it for your Dignitas. That's our own internal rank system, so I'll be explaining a lot about how my clan works and how, if you're a Ventru, to grow and what you should expect when you're interacting with a Ventru. Looks like we may have quite a few people joining us tonight because these broadcasts are getting very popular. So I'd like to say a big hello to everyone who's shown up. And I'm going to provide you with a couple of notes. First of all, these exist in the realm of soft RP. There's not an actual video floating around until such a time as a storyteller tells me that I'm allowed to have broadcasting rights to the entire Camarilla or vampires at large via some sort of secure system, but any information you learn here, you can use in character later on. Don't worry about spoilers or meta or anything. If I say it here, you can have the information. Second of all, some of the concepts I'm gonna be talking about are mechanically represented. So I'm gonna necessarily have to talk about things that aren't purely in character. In the link to this, I provided, um, sorry, in the description of this, I provided links to the Dignitas uh, calculator by Tim Bradner that's in a Google Doc, so pretty much anyone can access it. So if you're playing a Ventru, you'll be able to figure out how to calculate your Dignitas and what your current clan standing is. In order to use it, you're going to need to go to the file and then you're going to make a copy of it because the version he made is the master copy, so he can change it whenever he wants. And that means that you don't have to worry about updates. Your copy can be something that you can alter up as much as you need. I've also included a link to the Ventru clan guide in the description. That's provided by MES and gives you a little supplement of the expectations. Being a Ventru involves a lot of books over multiple issues and indeed multiple versions of Vampire because there's a Ventru clan in Requiem too. So there's a huge pile of expectations of things that you should or shouldn't do. And if it's not in the clan guide, then it's not officially canon. Generally, you can use the ideas involved to influence your roleplay. But if you start talking about Succor, for example, in this particular chronicle, people are going to look like at you like you're nuts, and you can't actually use that as an excuse. Like, if your praetor is like, why did you hide this person? And you're like, oh, well, but Succor, they're going to be like, what? This is normal, and this is because we don't have the ability to all own 50 copies of different books over the course of many, many iterations, some of which are contradictory and regrettable. And the last thing I linked to in the description is a link to the Out of Character Facebook group. If you're playing a Ventru and you want to reach out into the wider world and get to know people, that's where you want to hook up to get ties. It's not where the role-playing is taking place, which is on the lists or through your local venue. It's... But it is a good way to get to know people, to find a lineage if you want to join one, or otherwise get settled up. So, we're all settled in now? Let's get started. So, Ventru. It's not usual that you can see vampires pull together. It's not normal for our kind. The beast is a solitary, short-sighted creature who lives only to satiate immediate desires. She doesn't know about the future. She doesn't understand about consequences beyond stopping immediate pain. She can flee fire and possibly her own destruction, but she doesn't think about long-term visions. Very few clans manage cohesion. The Bruja manage it by being in constant conflict via ideologies of some kind or another, and even so, they're one long non-stop argument. The Tremere manage it via bonds of blood, and the Nosferatu manage it via shared persecution, being in a regrettable position of being reviled by most other kindred due to the regrettable flaw of their blood. But for the Ventru, we've managed to overcome that natural desire to pull away from each other based entirely on our enculturation, education, and expectations. 
There's no special gift of the blood that Ventru have that makes us more cohesive. That's entirely upbringing. Now, I would almost say the punchline to being a Ventru is that a lot of the time we end up working at heavy cross purposes. This is regrettable, and I'm not going to pretend that it doesn't happen, but this is largely because every single Ventru knows that if you can channel and pull together all the Ventru into a shared purpose, that pretty much becomes unstoppable. And when working together coherently, that's how you get inventions like the Camarilla. And that's how you got the Roman Empire. For good or for ill, a group of Ventru who actually can pull together are unstoppable. And that's not just because of their ability to lock arms and match fortitude with one another, although a Ventru turtle is certainly something to behold if you ever get the opportunity, but also because of three different things that underlie our ability to pull together and to succeed. Now, here's something that it's probably familiar to my two boys. It's an important thing that every successful Ventru needs to think about. If you want to succeed in the clan, you're going to need to ask yourself a question. Do I want people to admit I'm right, or do I want to win? The answer must always be, I want to win. And I say this not that you should give up on your morals. Sometimes wanting to win is about wanting the moral cause to win out. Perhaps you have a strong commitment to humanity, but if you get hung up on your pride and making other people admit that you're wonderful, then that tends to be the biggest flaw that members of my clan suffer in trying to grow their achievements and achieve their goals. There are three aspects that go into a successful Ventru. There is decorum, or your manners. There's your dignitas, or a measure of your merit within the clan and there's your relationships. There are many different ways to Ventru properly. Some Ventrus are martial, and the finest amongst them are part of the Knights of Blood. Some Ventrus are political. They hold positions of high office in both the Anarchs and the Camarilla. Some Ventrus are entirely focused on influences. They move the mortal world around like it's clay. But, Regardless of the kind of Ventru you are, and regardless of your origins or your rank in that great hierarchy of potence, blood, and age, every Ventru who ever succeeds knows a few little tricks that all boil down to those three things. Dr. Archer has provided a very intelligent observation about pride. If you're reading along in the comments, it's well worth noting that he mentioned that pride is a terrible danger for neonates in particular. The idea that there's something shameful about working under another, answering to someone else, is a foolish notion that they've seen in modern knights. Now, to give you an idea of the three different movements that make up the Ventru, you generally have the Imperium, who are rigidly hierarchical. These make up the majority of the elders of the clan, who have done most of the work to get us where we are, simply because they've existed longer, and also because they have the means to. You have the lords, who believe in a slightly more middle-of-the-road method, where it's necessary to allow for achievements. And you have the brokerage, who don't believe that the potency of the blood should be taken into account, nor should age. Simply the merit of the moment, with stocks rising and falling. Myself, I consider myself among the lords. This isn't because I'm a 17th century noblewoman. This is because you need to have a functioning and strong hierarchy. This functioning and strong hierarchy allows you to have something to fall back onto when things become chaotic. And also it prevents exploitation of people whose stock, shall we say, is still climbing or have experienced reversals for one reason or another. For example, let us say that you have a very competent individual who has experienced losses not entirely even their fault, causing them to lose much of their influence. Perhaps their city was attacked by the Sabbat and they have nothing to work with. Suddenly treating them like all their past work isn't worth anything would be 
a crime. On the other hand, it is necessary to provide opportunity for all ventures to achieve. And I will stand by this statement. If you are an elder or a patron of vassals and you are not thinking about the development of your vassals or of your childer and members of your lineage, whether they're adopted or of your own blood, you have fundamentally failed as a ventru. I think you would have failed as a kindred, at least morally, but as a ventru, the most important thing that you have are the people that you provide patronage to. Everyone within the clan has someone that they're a patron of. Even the smallest, thinnest-blooded neonate has a few ghouls or even a few mortals that they have influence over that they're responsible for. I'm going to start off by talking about decorum, because it's one of the more complicated subjects and one of the places where Ventru tend to get hung up. This is something, again, you think about decorum and you think about Mrs. Grisby, the strict auntie who cannot stand the behavior of someone if they misbehave and is ready to wrap your knuckles. Good manners are about making other people feel comfortable. This means that if the gangrel primogen starts to groom themselves in the middle of a meeting, or the new neonate Nosferatu that's being introduced to the prince doesn't know any better and calls them your worship and then dribbles all over the carpet, you don't grab for that low-hanging fruit and start abusing them for those things. That's actually one of the quickest ways to erode your power as a ventru. When we talk about having good manners, we mean that you're easy to work with and you have a certainly strong streak of empathy, but it's very hard to get under your skin. While all our kind have an immense quantity of pride, Ventru in particular are very prideful. We have good reason. There's many things that we achieve well at, and much of the time the masquerade is being held up by us entirely from force of will both through our influence and through our ability to change the minds of the mortals. But the minute that you're not ready to accept the possibility that other people are allowed to be what they are is the moment when your power starts to weaken. There are effective techniques and there are ineffective techniques. For example, if you're going to take leadership over an environment, you need to be very careful when you walk in. You shouldn't go in and say, like, I am the king. There's an old saw about the person who has to say that they're the king is never the king. You become the king by having other people recognize you're the king. If you're new to an environment, the best thing you can do is find out what everybody needs and go out and work on helping them. Now, in the past, we didn't understand leadership as well, and we tended to teach what's called these days great man theory. The idea that a single great man will rule over everyone? If you're really frustrated and you can't figure out, why is nobody listening to me? I'm a powerful individual. I have all this influence. I have an infinite amount of money. Why does nobody respect me? The answer is probably that you haven't thought about your people. We know now that every successful king is actually the representative of a consortium of a group of people. This is whether you have a dictator, a successful board leader, or a successful criminal gang in the streets. Your people are your first and foremost investment, and if you do not have a people to lead, and you do not have a people that have invested in you, you will never go anywhere. Myself, I am aware that if I do not maintain a mutually beneficial relationship with my vassals and with those people who have agreed to serve me, I will very rapidly become unworthy of them. This doesn't mean that I'm constantly poking boons into them. This means that I have to be aware of what they need, and I have to be aware of what they want. I also have to be aware of what will benefit their development, and I need to have a reasonable assessment of their skills and their weaknesses without being overly critical of the things that make them uniquely them. Now, amongst Ventru, we have certain customs that may seem stiff and rigid. If you are being absolutely correct, the appropriate form of address for a Ventru within your own clan is either Mr. or Mrs. or it is their in-clan title. That is if you're interacting within each other. It is not required that another Ventru refer to me as Prince Marbury, even though I'm the Prince of Montreal. They should refer to me as Praetor Marbury of Montreal. 
or if they're referring to me in conversation, they could refer to me as Mrs. Mulberry. Now, that being said, I already spoke about how it's necessary that manners are accommodating. It's an affectation of many older kindred in particular, especially those who came from the mortal nobility to use lord or lady. And in fact, many lineage heads will use lord or lady as a way of representing they're a little bit above that. So, well, the correct way to address someone would be Mr., Mrs., or their title. By the way, I use Praetor, which is the older form of it, but as the brokerage continues to gain some degree of strength within our clan, there is a whole slew of modern titles. The modern titles are more accommodating to the idea that the lords and ladies and the brokerage have gained some ground against the Imperium and serve a certain degree of cooperation. These days, we have anarchs in every tier of the leadership positions within our clan, and it's important to remember that they're a valid part of our internal system as well. A leader is a leader is a leader is a leader. Now, the reason why you use Mr. or Mrs. is that you're establishing a base level courtesy about how you address that person. It's an act of respect, which is reflected as well in how we refer to our dignitas. Every ventru starts at an acceptable level. The Iron or associates, your every night ventru, are considered to be acceptable members of the clan. They have received appropriate training. They have been released. This level of base respect is part of how you need to treat even those who are very below you on the hierarchy. It can be very tempting, particularly when you become an elder, to decide that the neonates come and go and that they pass and you don't need to remember their names. But it is very important to recognize that even the lowliest neonate of the 13th generation is still acceptable as a ventru. Now, another point about being a ventru in decorum is the manner of our dress. Now, the lazy ventru prefers to wear a suit, and there is no shame in simplifying your night. However, there are many other ways to dress correctly. As any ventru older than two centuries knows, what was once the garb of a king has changed considerably. When I was alive, it was the pinnacle of masculinity to have pastel bows in your cascading curls and to trot about in high-heeled boots. In my grandfather's day, he was a leader of many men and made do with a long white linen robe and a wool cloak. I think the only ornament he had was a torque of gold that he wore around his neck. All these means of expression and all these different cultures that contribute to the Ventru, for the Ventru are hardly uniquely European. One of the most prestigious and powerful Ventru is Mithras of Persia. Now, he's long since left us, but if your idea of Ventru is a white gentleman, then you've entirely gotten our clan wrong. Another thing I want to talk about regarding decorum is a matter of a Ventru's personal business. The reality is that all kindred have rich inner lives. We have intimate relationships, we have friends, we have families, we have challenges, and we have difficulties. Within our clan, it is considered incredibly impolite to bring up someone's personal business or really anything that's not relevant to the conversation at hand. This is not because we expect that Ventru live joyless, colorless lives. This is because it's a necessary courtesy to protect the privacy of other Ventru. I know, for example, my cousin Felicity is very beautiful, but it would be completely inappropriate for me to ask her uninvited about her suitors. Likewise, you have failed as a Ventru if you go for low-hanging fruit. If you decide to pick at the argument that somebody had with their sire, or the fact that they perhaps have not been as successful with their lover. And that goes into another point that I'm going to make, which is that you should avoid insulting people wherever possible. 
Remember where I talked about that question, when you want to succeed? Whether it's better to have someone know that you're right, or whether it's better to win? If you want to win, winning is not about seeing that little look of pain in someone's face where you find a weak spot and you jab in. Every time you hurt somebody, their beast takes a tiny note for it. And if they're particularly skilled and embrace the idea of decorum, they will turn the other cheek and they will think about you as a whole person in your capacity. But it's very normal for persons to maintain this little hurt. This weakens them and it weakens you. For example, I don't necessarily get along with every single venture out there. I love my clan, but I acknowledge that there's going to be differences of opinion. I recently got into a conflict with another venture. I realized that I could certainly rip into them all claws out and tell everyone how terrible they are and point out all their little weak points because I'm very good at that. But then I thought about it. I care deeply about the unity within my clan. And if I go for that low hanging fruit and tell everyone, oh, they're so terribly, let's say insecure, then the fact that we need them to hold the line and the position that they're in is going to lead to long-term discourse. They're not going to trust me to provide them with aid, which I should, which means that they're going to be at a disadvantage. They're not going to be as forthcoming with me, which means our clan fails. It's normal to have our disagreements, but it's not healthy to allow them to fester. And to do that, you must avoid insulting people unnecessarily. This also means that you should avoid anything that's just a simple personal attack. It doesn't matter if the prince is fat, or the Nosferatu is ugly, or if the Tremere has a speech impediment. All these things are simply off limits. I know it can be very appealing to say, oh, there's Lispy again. It makes you feel like you're very important. But again, you're losing out on something. Don't get into a fight with someone over something small and petty, unless you're essentially saying, I am prepared to see this through and kill you. Remember that our kind doesn't have any way of getting away from each other. In another hundred years, you're still going to be stuck with that person unless somebody, you or them, is dead. So good manners is not just our way of controlling our beast, but also a way of making sure that we simply don't fly into constant infighting. Remember, Ventru, like all kindred, have long memories, but this is, for good or for ill, your family. Now, the next thing I'm going to talk about is probably why you're here, your dignitas, what it is, and how to increase it. Your dignitas is your measure of worth within Ventru society. The highest tier of your dignitas is those who are peerless, and there's only a few members of society who reach that rank, the NPCs. All Ventru begin as acceptable, and unless you're not worthy to be a Ventru, you have an acceptable level of dignitas. Increasing and growing in this position is a matter of a few combined things. Some of it are the inborn aspects that make you you and have things to contribute. And I will note that your dignitas is slanted towards your effort to take leadership in public service, your skills in things that classically our clan are known for, your powers of the blood, and there's one category you'll be very happy to hear about, the deeds and achievements that you happen to have made. Now, if you look about it, it may feel like the easiest way to raise your dignitas, that is your standing within society, is to simply knock off the influence within your environment and maximize every resource available there. That's an excellent way for a neonate or perhaps an ancilla to climb in rank. For an elder such as myself, influence comes and goes, and it can become more challenging for us to keep our finger on the pulse of that mortal matter. 
For myself, I know that I'm frequently traveling here and there to maintain ties with other elders. And this means that I don't necessarily have time to keep all my pots on the stove. Luckily for me, my rank is also built on other things. I am strong in certain powers of the blood. I'm a prince of Montreal through dint of my skill and the support of my beloved people. I'm the praetor of Montreal, and I am a vassal of Lord Asher. Now, vassalage is another tradition of the Ventru, that is to swear service for a period of time, sometimes a year, sometimes longer, where you agree to, by contract, provide them with a service, and they provide you with patronage and support. For myself, serving Asher was a mutually agreeable arrangement. I need to stabilize certain parts of Canada. He has access to connections and resources beyond that which I can achieve. He also provides a useful buffer. For example, if I'm dealing with another luminary elder and things get ridiculous, it's his job to gently diffuse the situation. And... In turn, I go about and handle things on a more granular street level. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry about those noises. Alan is practicing again. He's an excellent pianist, or will be in another couple of years. Anyway. When it comes to growing your dignitas, these low-hanging fruits seems like a good idea. So one thing that you should consider doing is sending out to serve someone in vassalage or encouraging other persons to serve you. And now when you take someone to serve you, that doesn't just mean you pat out your dignitas with being able to say, ah, I have four vassals, two of which are in other domains. And that is another thing. It is more prestigious for a member of our society to maintain networked ties outside your own city than it is to say that you're in charge of all the Ventru locally. If you have four Ventru who are vassal to yourself, you're probably the Praetor, and we're somewhat exaggerating the necessity of having those vassals in the first place. If you have a four vassals, and three of them are located in different domains, you have considerably more resources at your disposal. Now, it can feel somewhat daunting as a kindred of less blood potency, that is not an elder, to find someone to serve themselves. Indeed, for someone of myself, a pretender elder, it can feel, looking at the reality, that it's simply not fair. I'm not going to be able to get anyone to serve me. And therein lies that tricky little third part. Well, there's certain things that you're embraced with and that you can't change. I inherited an aura of command so that the normal mortal mind melts like putty under my gaze. And I'm certainly potent enough of the blood to carry certain advantages, but my deeds are entirely my responsibility to go out and find. And as a patron, it is my job to increase the dignitas of those in my service by making sure that they have access to achieve. If I just have a patron who's doing nothing in no particular place, I have failed them. One of the things I can advertise, and this is regardless of my potency of blood or my age, is the amount of social prestige and resources I have at their disposal to help them take risks. For example, my vassal Praetor Mantle, who is also the primitive Sorry, the Seneschal, I don't know where my mouth is today. The Seneschal of Kelowna is better served by me helping her reach out and get more support from others than she'd ever be by telling him, oh, lead a very conservative life. Keep Kelowna quiet and calm. This incidentally is one of the reasons why when you encounter a Ventru, they will be reaching out to grab whatever power happens to be within their reach. They Curiously, for a clan that's supposed to be conservative, can be some of the most risk-taking clans ever. For example, Praetor Lockwood of Vancouver is perfectly comfortable playing chicken on behalf of the entire Camarilla with the Independent Alliance because he's aware that, well, it is perfectly possible that they will murder him and mail him to me with his mouth full of live snakes or any number of other bad possible outcomes. 
Praetor Lockwood is aware that only through this sort of bold action is he able to climb. Now, if you're not particularly inclined to risk, there is one other way that you can get deeds. And deeds can also be through hosting grandiose events. There's a lot of difficult organizing required in preparing to allow kindred to visit, and it's also perfectly possible for someone to spoil your event, so you need to be of a more managerial sort of person. And you can get a major deed for organizing an event attended by kindred of the entire region. So, that's definitely worth thinking about. But if you're someone like myself, who lives in an area well, where we get individual guests, it's very unlikely that we're ever going to host an event for kindred from across the nation, or kindred from across the world, it then falls to myself to look for other achievements. I'm going to talk a little bit about mechanics. So, you've got your basic deeds, you've got your local deeds, those are within your domain, you've got your major deeds, that's a deed that affects your region. That can be you did something that significantly affected another domain within your region, you hosted an event within your region that was attended, for example, a featured game of the month, or a regional showcase, or it could mean um, that you did a great achievement within your domain that affected other things. For example, if you build a communications network that got adopted in multiple domains, that's a regional achievement that, or in Canada's case, that's a region as well for purposes of calculations. And then you have your epic deeds, which are things on a global scale. Those are things that affect the entire world, which for the purposes of the game are North America and the United Kingdom, which is a little unfortunate, but we don't currently have any linked um, domains in continental Europe and nothing going on in Africa, Asia, or Australia. I know, it sucks. In order to get recognized for these, you need to use the application system through the database. You're going to app for it to get it recognized and your storyteller will sign off. And depending on the level of the deed, you'll get your approval from there. If it's a local deed, then you just need your local storyteller to say, yep, yeah, totally defeated all the hunters. If you got... Um, if you stopped all the hunters in a domain next door to yourself, you can apply for a regional deed or otherwise coordinate something. For an elder, you're not supposed to be running out and doing things. So I'm going to drop in character and I'm going to explain a little bit more about how you can have linked deeds. And I'm going to talk about a kindred who exemplifies a very good local deed. All right. There. Sorry about that. Alan had a quick question for me and I needed to answer it. He wanted to know whether Brioche was getting the best food or the superb food? The answer is both. Anyway, when you're looking for an achievement, you need to make sure that it's recognized by your entire clan, which means that other people need to hear about it. An example of an amazing local deed would be something achieved by Dr. David Archer recently. He's the primogen of Boston and a very accomplished young venture neonate. Now, he was formerly a talon of the Harpy, that's Kessler, and he became aware that Kessler had suffered a grievous attack in the hands of some Tremere elders. Now, that would mean that Dr. Archer had to do something about this because he cares about the survival of his city. Dr. Archer proceeded to do some independent research and worked with Kessler closely to find out what horrors he'd suffered. With the consent of Kessler, he gained additional resources via an elder Duval to set Kessler's minds to right. And it seems like me being in this particular conversation has caused everyone to think that they need to talk to me. Sorry about that. Alan! Alan! Go get the shotgun! We're getting bothered by hunters again! Sorry about that. If you hear any booms, that's Alan taking care of the problems. Montreal can be a little chaotic sometimes. You know how it is. Anyway, I was interrupted in the middle of talking about Dr. David Archer's achievement. Dr. David Archer made sure that with all powers at his disposal, he set 
Harpy Kessler's mind to write and uncovered the issue. He immediately made sure that the sheriff and the prince were informed. Now the Orlovs have been commanded to appear before Prince Alfaraz in their bodies and not remotely to explain their conduct. There is a very large chance that they will be minus their arms and legs or bits and pieces if their answers are not satisfactory. Now I can say nothing but respectful things about the Orlovs. I don't understand their situation. But I can say that Dr. David Archer behaved entirely correctly as a neonate, utilizing all resources within his disposal and acting for the public good to rescue poor Harpy Kessler from the situation he was in. He brought it to the attention of the appropriate authorities and deserves all recognition as a minor deed, as well as celebration within our clan. An example of a successful major deed would be Praetor Kira Mantle of Kelowna, who successfully brokered an agreement with the Independent Alliance to reduce the quantity of boons required to act and operate within the domain of Vancouver. Now, it's reasonable that persons taking residence would be expected to contribute to the collective defense, represented by the presence of boons, but with consistent complaints for mistreatment from Camarilla members within the domain, it became necessary for her, under my supervision, to coordinate a letter campaign. Having received no response to our polite letters, it became necessary to further gather attention, since any communication we received was both informal and very impolite. The result was very potent and further emphasized the fact that the Camarilla does not abandon its members. It is coincidental during the achievement of this major deed that the Anarchs, who had previously devotedly served the Independent Alliance, apparently decided that they didn't want to have masters anymore and told the Independent Alliance that they weren't going to serve them. Who would have thought that? It's remarkable. Anarchs not interested in being the lapdogs of another sect? Color me surprised. It's almost like that's particularly their mandate. In any case, by correctly utilizing resources and influence at her disposal, Ms. Mantle was able to make an impact not just within her own domain, but beyond that. She's an incredibly competent Ventru, and as a result, Praetor Lockwood, myself, and Praetor Mantle all received recognition within our clan and a commensurate increase in our internal clan status. If I recall right, last I checked, Praetor Lockwood had actually already become vaunted. Vaunted is quite an achievement, particularly for someone of his level of blood potency, but he is an excellent example of someone to watch for. And if I miss my guess, if he survives until the end of the year, there is a very good chance that he's going to end up being somebody's troubleshooter, or if you want to use the old term, a lictor. Now, going back to talking about your dignitas, there are a few reasons why you might want to raise it. First of all, there's a matter of the prestige within the clan, and it's used to settle questions of who might speak first. If you are a Ventru, you're not supposed to interrupt people. That's one of the rules about being a Ventru. Doesn't matter how long, loud, dreary, pompous, or windbaggy someone is, it is not acceptable for me to cut someone off and be speaking immediately. I don't like that. Just as I would never use the powers of the blood on another Ventru, and understand this, that that's another no-no that will deeply impact your dignitas. If you are caught using the powers of blood on another member of your clan, I would simply never consider that. Thus, your dignitas allows you to determine prestige and communication. It does not, however, determine that a person of significantly higher dignitas is able to crush out another person speaking. It's worth noting that while the praetor is usually determined by the person with the highest dignitas, it is possible for a board meeting to remove a praetor just as a lictor may step into a domain, it's 
also perfectly possible for someone of a lower dignitas to hold a higher rank within the clan. For example, the minimum dignitas to be considered for a strategoi or executive is praiseworthy. This means that you would hold a rank above a person who was vaunted. Although they are recognized for the deeds within the clan, you still hold the higher rank within our clan's hierarchy. Therefore, you are not venturing correctly if you go up to someone and tell them, you there, I am praiseworthy. You are merely commendable. Lackey, fetch me my coat and listen to my opinions. You have no right to criticize me for I, I am praiseworthy and you, you are merely commendable. If you do that, you will make yourself into a laughing stock, and a polite ventru will put their hands over their mouths so as not to embarrass you. On the other hand, something else that will make you a laughing stock, if you forget there is such a thing as an anarch ventru, you will seem hopelessly out of touch. I say this not as a criticism to make you feel bad, I say this as something that you need to keep in mind. You may not be happy about the fact that there are Anorg Ventru, but the collective will of the clan has thus decided to recognize their dignitas. I have been informed, though I have trouble believing this, that some Sabat Ventru still care about dignitas, but you don't need to worry about, if you meet a Sabat Ventru, none of the rules apply. If they start doing this at you, and it's a matter of a parlay, for example, a diplomatic meeting to deal with the blood accords, I strongly recommend you don't start throwing around powers of the blood or calling them any manner of rude names. But, on the other hand, don't expect them to be obeying any sort of rules. Which, I should observe, another thing you need to keep in mind is your obligation to look other ventures in the eye. Now, there's different ways you can indicate respect. In some cultures, you look down and you never make eye contact with a king or queen. And demure decorum is expressed through submission of the gaze. This is not the case from Ventru, because our powers are based on achieving attention. It's therefore a good idea to indicate that you don't think that the other Ventru is out to get you by making sure that you're capable of warm, normal eye contact. Try to avoid unwavering, creepy eye contact if you're a scared neonate and you're afraid of offending them. If you look like this, you're going to very much indicate that you're utterly terrified of the person. And if you have trouble maintaining eye contact and you think it's going to look weird and focused, try bouncing your gaze. Try moving it around their face and use their eyebrows as a focal point to avoid that starey, pop-eyed thing as not all Ventru are inherently blessed with strong social skills. We tend to embrace amongst those who do, but particularly for Ventru who, I've had it explained to me that it's the, the asparagus, spargus, uh, Asperger's, the, the autism spectrum. Such Ventru are still a valued member of the clan and therefore it is necessary to be accommodating. There are other little ways that you can show respect and courtesy. For example, if you have the resources warming your body so that if you clasp hands, they feel this is a little way of showing that you care about another individual. It's a very subtle trick, but it's very much worth it. If you don't have the blood, you can try a warm bath. Now, the other thing that deeds are important for is those people who are considering on becoming a Knight of Blood. The Knights of Blood are our martial order, and in order to focus on developing your skills for combat, your influence may suffer. Fear not. The thing you need to do is go find places to make achievements. If you do those, and you show your skill, very quickly you will be recognized and inducted into their order. The correct address, regardless of gender, for a Knight of Blood is Sir. My uncle Gareth is a Knight of Blood, and therefore I refer to him as Sir Gareth, or, if I'm feeling playful, Sir Uncle. And that's another thing to bring up. Different Ventru families have different levels of hierarchy expected within our family. For example, I sincerely doubt my liege would enjoy it if someone started calling him Papa Asher, or even more, Tata Asher, which is Latin for daddy. 
but um, on the other hand, it is perfectly acceptable within the Everard family to use a familiar name. For example, my nephew prefers to be called Samson instead of Mr. Reynolds, and feels quite uncomfortable and unwelcome if you use Mr. Reynolds on him. And my uncle, who is the Prince of Los Angeles, is perfectly comfortable with me referring to him as uncle, not Prince Reichard or Praetor Reichard or whatever is applicable. Mechanically speaking, as you climb the Dignitas ranks, initially you're not going to need to worry that much about your achievements, although at least one of them has to be some sort of deed that you did contemporarily once you're getting past a certain level. But when you want to get it to Admired, which is the highest level you can get as a player, you're going to need to actually get a global app for it. And this is also partially because they're just trying to manage who does what. There's apps that are involved. For example, they want you to app if you're Praetor. That's not because they're planning on saying no to you. That's because um, they want to make sure that they keep track of it because they may want to pass plot down further and someone somewhere has a little database that they're keeping. Again, don't be as scared of the applications. It's largely so they can keep track of how many they have. For example, if literally everyone went out and made a Bally character, it would be very worth knowing if an entire domain was Stealth Bally. I think that would be a very interesting game, albeit a very short one, but... Apps are not necessarily there to make you feel bad, they're there to keep track. I got asked, I do have a question. What if a prince forsake a kindred and used a blood hunt to avoid a praxis challenge, and you are commendable and he is esteemed? Well, you can certainly discuss this with him at the next board meeting, or with her, but at the moment, you certainly cannot use your clan rank to pull rank within a sect situation. You also shouldn't do this during intersect politics when you're interacting with each other. For example, if I went up to say that I'm in the process of becoming vaunted, walked up to the advocate of New York and said, You there, I am vaunted, you are merely praiseworthy, you must listen to me. I imagine I would probably be in trouble because I would have done her an injury from the amount of laughing that she'd be doing. So, no, you cannot pull clan rank to attempt to remove someone from being able to conduct their office. What your internal clan rank does give you is the ability to set priorities. This means that since you have more potential talking time in a meeting, and the process by which your opinion will be weighted will be by according to your clan rank. While you would expect to have the Praetor chairing the meeting, on the other hand, they would be going down the ranks of dignitas for who would be sharing their opinion when, and there is one small exception to the don't interrupt rule. If you are two dignitas higher, that's two ranks of dignitas higher, you may interrupt someone. I don't recommend it though. It's not polite and it would have to be something where you would feel that they were in imminent danger if you need to interrupt them. For example, if your praetor has launched into a long speech about the future of the city and you happen to notice that there's a hunter creeping up behind them with a vat of holy water, it's all right to interrupt them. There may be an inquiry later by a lictor, but I promise it will be all right. Lord Asher is correct. If you're treating your dignitas like it's a rank, where someone with a higher dignitas is therefore unreproachable and cannot receive the opinion of another kindred, you are venturing incorrectly. If you're treating your dignitas as an excuse to stomp all over another kindred, you are using your dignitas incorrectly. And I want to talk about something else that ties into both dignitas and decorum. One of the hardest parts about leadership is learning not to immediately react to someone. If someone starts petty gossip at you, for example, let's say you're having a public meeting with someone, or you're participating in our private list server and having a conversation about clan priorities. If someone leaps in and starts talking about personal business or making personal attacks about you or suggesting that you're of poor moral character, it can be very tempting to st 
stamp your feet and put your fists down and say, this will not do, how dare you? Or even step in with arch little comments. It's like, well, if the praetor of Abu Dhabi would say that I am reprehensible, I am sure they are entitled to their opinion. The best response to someone making a fool out of themselves in public is to politely disregard it much in the same way that you would politely ignore someone making a little mistake of manners. You don't go wading in to do that, and a lot of the weakness of our clan is that we tend to listen to our pride, and, for example, we'll be dealing with various people of the same rank of us, and we'll be gently jockeying for who has the stronger opinion, because every Ventru feels like they have something to contribute. This is not necessarily a flaw, and I wouldn't say bad things about my clan for this, but there is a need to get these priorities out there. Which brings me to the final thing that goes into growing your Ventru, and that's your relationships. The Ventru who succeed are not the Ventru who are a lone person going out and achieving, and they're actually not even the lone lineages. The most successful Ventru are entirely the persons who are networked, not just within their clan, but outside their clan. Some Ventru focus more within internal clan-related issues, and some Ventru consider outside their clan as important. Those who are Camarilla loyalists often end up heavily invested outside their clans. Some Ventru even manage intersect politics. Madame Geis, one of the most prestigious Ventru and current leader of the executive board, is heavily networked with the Giovanni and made some effort to bring them into the Camarilla. This was not accepted at this time, but I actually think that Madame Geis had a great deal of merit with this idea. I'd be willing to discuss this at a later time if you'd prefer of why the Giovanni belong in the Camarilla. Although I understand some of the arguments made by the other clans as well. But on that subject, about your people and nurturing your people, I've already gone and said that if you want to be a leader, it's a matter of making sure you nurture the people below you. If you want to succeed as a Vintru, you also need to be able to correctly pick patrons. Now, it can be very tempting to, shall we say, tether your horse to one wagon and expect everything to go accordingly, but in order to be a successful Ventru, you need to put some time into talking to various members of your clan, and you need to make sure that they have positive experiences with you. This doesn't mean that I expect every Ventru to be a social butterfly, but it's always a good idea to have some sincere, positive things you can say about other people. Although terrible things get said about gossips, the best gossips are the people who know about everybody's success, and a huge portion of my success. Now, you might wonder, how did a Ventru from a backwater region in a city that's consistently on fire who's nobody had ever heard of for the last 300 years, who's just been an elder for 17 years, end up being one of the most famous Ventru in North America. Indeed, I'm probably one of the more famous kindred, remarkably enough. The answer is that I genuinely like people, and I'm more than anything else interested in what great things that they've achieved. I've managed to gain the service of many people, not because I wade in and tell them that I am mighty and strong and they need to respect me, largely by asking them what are they looking to achieve and how can I make them grow beyond their region? Indeed, you can often remove a great deal of conflict by looking at a picture from a larger perspective. For example, one of the recent conflicts going on in a small region of Canada is entirely determined by somebody who is a very strong achiever who has a great deal of potential but they're in a small region that is relatively locked down by myself. It would be very tempting to reach out and crush them and remove them entirely. But the answer is that I should be listening to what they're telling me by battering against my influence, which is that they have outgrown their pot. Now, I could prune their roots and reduce them back down to something that would fit inside my little flower pot, or I could recognize that they're trying to tell me they're ready to go outside into the broader garden. The other thing about your people and your relationships is also knowing when to pick your battles and when hierarchies need to exist, and even when you necessarily disagree with someone of higher rank, why they need to be there. I don't necessarily agree with every luminary. Myself, I adopt a policy that tends to be very hierarchical to my own luminary. 
there are not necessarily everyone that I agree with, but I also understand that unless another lineage of Ventru is act actively involved in some terrible crime like infertilism, or actively selling the clan out to another clan, then even if I disagree with them, the idea of attacking another lineage because I don't like their luminary and tearing them apart is something that should give me a lot of pause. It will be necessary sometimes to be in conflict with my own clan, but it should never expand to that point. And that's one thing, again, that I have to take into consideration. I don't need to be right. I need to win. And in order to win, that means I need to recognize sometimes it's my job to apologize. Sometimes it doesn't matter if Cornelia Mauber is clever and sparkly and pretty and goes out and achieves all her goals. Sometimes it matters that somebody is a luminary elder and they are bravely holding together an entire lineage of people. And well, I'm reasonably competent and I know that there are persons of great power that I might give pause to. The act of attacking them and making war on them is again inappropriate. It is better for me to accept my place beneath them and make sure they understand that I apologize if I've wronged them. And this means a sincere apology, not just a sorry you were offended apology. Those are terrible. Do not do sorry you were offended. If you don't understand why they're offended or they were unreasonable about it, don't tell them that. Never try to explain to someone why they're wrong for having the feelings they have. You don't get to decide that you didn't hurt other people. If they're upset, they get to decide that. When you're giving an apology, make sure that if you don't understand what you did to offend them, one of the things you do is make it clear that you take their feelings into account and you want them to show you. I've been asked by Marcus Antonius, a Ventru who is currently doing a somewhat unorthodox un agoge in his leadership portion, where he has to display leadership in order to be released, how would I define winning? Winning is about achieving your goals. Your goals could be many things. If you're a very humanist venture, maybe your goal is better treatment for ghouls in your city. Maybe your goal is mine and you'd like to see a unified, stronger venture able to pull together in whatever coming challenges may be approaching this. <laughs> there goes Alan playing the piano again. These goals and winning means being able to look beyond what your beast wants, which is the very immediate animal basic needs, and being able to see that. So let's say that I'm in a conflict with another pretender elder, and I think that this pretender elder is a reprehensible person who embodies everything that I think is wrong with a Ventru. I could put myself as the moral guardian and decide, I'm going to stand up there and tell them that they're wrong, and they're bad and terrible and noxious, and they deserve to suffer and feel bad. But this would be losing sight of my actual goal, which is a unified venture. Now, it might happen that I decide that the entire clan needs me to step in and appoint myself moral guardian, but it's more likely that that's my pride speaking and telling me that it's not okay for them not to respect me, my opinions matter. Why don't they recognize that I'm wonderful? I know I'm wonderful. If I'm doing that, then I'm in a position where I've utterly failed and I've allowed my worst self to determine things. If I'm going to be in dominion over a significant number of people, I have to be ready to put aside some of that. That doesn't mean that I'm doing some sort of act of self-flagellation and that I'm a better person. This means that I'm aware of my worser self and my flaws, and I understand that my competitive streak needs to be challenged not from the immediate to the larger range of things. Now, I hope that's given you more of an idea of how to succeed as a venture and what to expect when you're interacting with them. I'd like to open the floor to any questions if you have them. Afterwards, I've after I've answered some questions, I'll give you some more news about what's going on in New York. So. Any further questions? I've answered about winning. We've received some excellent commentary about releasing your pride and being ready to give yourself in service to others. Questions? No questions? Come on, don't be shy. Make sure I haven't missed anything. Yes, Dr. Archer has reminded all Ventru to remember to blink. 
this can sometimes be a matter that you will forget to, particularly if your humanity is plummeting. And indeed, that's one of the warning signs that someone's humanity might be suffering a little bit as they start looking a little hurt. And they just sit here like this. If people start giving you that face, it probably means that it's time to talk to their sire or another person they're close to about how best to approach them and discuss with them. That's another thing. If you're being responsible, not bringing up someone's personal business means that if you're not close to them, you may need to wait for them to come to you to be able to offer stuff. Being a Ventru is about being aware of the meta situation. That's a modern word I'm rather fond of. Meta is so much fun. It's a matter of knowing when it's all right to ask questions. Ah, my son Dragomir has asked me, how do I destroy my enemies when they can beat me into a bloody mess? Well, the answer to that is very simple. For reasons I'm not entirely sure, our hereditary enemy has always been the Bruja. Now, the reality is it's more like a more complicated family. And the answer to that is that you don't get into physical fights with them. There's probably things that you do considerably better than they ever can do. And if you control the social environment around them, you make it so that what you do is considered to be more valued than their ability to beat you up. Now, if they're going up to you and constantly threatening you with violence, you have a slightly worse problem than just their ability to beat you. But things you can consider as an option depend entirely on whether there's someone in your environment you're in a challenge with, or whether you just happen to be in the middle of a war zone and this person is a beat stick. Now, the thing about people who are born to provide only cannon fodder is that a lot of the time that problem will go away. For example, I know of a particular city, and I'm not going to be specific so as not to hurt anyone's feelings, where there was some Anarchs who were not on board with the Edict of Succession. Now, it might have been possible for the Camarilla to go to war directly with them, but this was a very dangerous environment, and if they'd ever engaged in violent conflict, they would have put everyone in peril and ignored the main problems, which was, for example, the encroaching Hunter Plague. Instead of doing that, we quite wisely understood that it was a matter of letting nature take its course. The sort of people who only have one solution, and that's the sword, tend to die by the sword. So, well, you could follow Lord Asher's suggestion and convince your allies to do the beating for you. Largely speaking, those of whom are not constantly going out into conflict and have other problem-solving abilities can simply wait very patiently, and the problem tends to take care of itself. In the case of these Anarchs, who did not believe in the Edict, their boldness caused them to abandon humanity, and they proceeded to cause some grievous issues that involved the murder of 30 people. As a result, the hunters killed them down to a man. In the case of your hypothetical situation, let's say it's a couple of kindred that you can't interfere with because they're necessary for the protection of the city. Chances are, if you simply leave them be, they will either offend enough people, because if they're offending you, they're probably nasty persons, that they will eventually be removed from the social environment, or you can wait until the environment they're in kills them for you. So, well, being a Ventru often means getting used to being punched and simply knowing how to ignore it. A lot of it is about patience and not letting people get a rise out of you. Let's say that these people are incredibly rude. Being able to impeccably and patiently wait for them to rage and carry on and posture and stomp and tell you that you're stupid and that they hate you and you're the worst thing ever and whatever they consider is necessary can be matched by nodding and smiling and waiting until they're done. Or if you don't have any patience, just let them get a little pause because eventually even a kindred needs to suck in air and ask them, are you done? This will generally take care of the problem for you, and again, it can feel like you're less than, and this is something particularly important for male kindred. Um, 
Life is not fair, and male kindred often feel like they're pressured to get into physical conflicts that female kindred are not asked to. The reality is that male and female kindred, and those kindred who do not identify on the binary, are all equally physically competent. Our strength is not determined by our flesh, but by the potency of our blood and where the potency of our blood has been focused. So if you're a male kindred, I do understand that you may be called upon into physical conflict, but generally speaking, that goes back to developing a people. If someone is a beat stick, the thing you can do is become more popular than them, you can become more socially regarded than them, and you can provide organizational things that they can't provide. The fundamental solution of being able to punch someone is the last argument of kings. If they're down to that as their only argument with you, that means they have no other arguments whatsoever. It can be tough food to swallow when you have to deal with that. But do keep in mind that you have many, many, many more arguments. Well, all they have is their ability to test your fortitude. Do I have any further questions or shall I move into the news from New York? All right then, the news from New York. I found out that many members of my clan have decided to travel to New York. Well, of course, the Anarch Ventru are attending to their issue in Brooklyn. The Ventru of the Camarilla have made a strong showing to the call to arms, providing leadership and influence. They are not going to intervene in any way in Brooklyn. This would be in violation of the Blood Accords, and no Ventru of the Camarilla would ever do that. I know this because I know that all Ventru of the Camarilla understand this. I'm going to suggest that this may be incredibly painful because this may mean watching a massacre. I understand that a lot of you have started to develop connections with people even within the movement, and this may mean watching them die to a man. I understand that this is going to be painful, but I also understand that what you will do that will help everyone is to stay within the castle. Hold the siege, be ready with your influence, and keep the communications network open. See where the hot spots pop up, communicate them back to the people who are doing the influence management, and make sure that you close down. It doesn't matter whether it's Sabat brawling, loose werewolves, anarchs. The point is not intervening in their conflict. The point is that it's one of the more densely populated areas in the United States, and they've decided to have a war between the Anarchs, and who tend not to be as skilled with influence or with using secondary proxies like ghouls, and the Sabbat. And the Sabbat are not known for their humanity or their restraint. Add into this a large quantity of rogue weaponized werewolves, and we're looking at an environment which may have a considerable quantity of mortal casualties. Having coordinated efforts to maintain the masquerade is crucial for this. Now, the Anarchs have promised that they're going to maintain short-term telecommunications blackouts to stop things like people with phones filming the mayhem that they're witnessing. But there's so many things that are going to be happening in New York that the blanket ability to muffle everything is going to be crucial. Now, there are a few things that frighten me, but a war in a heavily populated area is something that will give me nightmares. Montreal is appalling enough. We don't need New York descending into chaos. Well, I'm very sure that the Anarchs know exactly what they're doing and will have control of the situation, probably win the fight. It remains necessary to observe that what we can do is what we've always done as the Camarilla. We are the inventors of the masquerade, and if we can't keep this intact in this modern era, we are being taught a valuable lesson about change. So, if you believe in the Camarilla and you are a Ventru, it is your job to go to New York and lend your influence to contain this issue. Or if you cannot do that, to make sure that you do everything in your power that this doesn't crack open. We can't stop the Anarchs and the Sabbat from fighting. They have their reasons. But what we can do is make sure that we don't suffer. And we can also make sure that Prince Ryder is protected. We can make sure that our resident Strategoi has forces that they can draw upon, because I'm not entirely sure that these are the proper Sabbat. These indeed may be the apostates that we've been dealing with. 
and apostate sabbats feel no need whatsoever to cooperate with the blood accord. These apostate sabbat may indeed proceed to run rampaging not through the streets of Brooklyn, but the entire city, and it would be a terrible pity if Prince Ryder was undefended during their ability to mass mobilize. So, I repeat this call to arms. If you are a Camarilla Ventru, do not go into the streets of Brooklyn, but be prepared to stay within the confines of the Camarilla territory with your influence and hold the line. I don't want to be reading the news in 2018 to hear about how we've suddenly discovered that vampires are real and they're terrorists who destroyed New York. That more or less draws my broadcast to conclusion. I think I've answered all your questions, and I certainly enjoyed spending time with you tonight. I hope you learned a little bit about how to achieve, and I would love for you to share in the comments if you're a Ventru or you know a Ventru who's done something, what you think you deserve to be recognized for. And don't think that just means that you stopped the hunters or you did something remarkable involving learning an out-of-clan discipline. Even if you did something like started a new hairstyle on trend or got a courtesy passed in your domain, all these things really are genuinely relevant and deserve celebrating just as much. So I look forward to seeing in those comments what you've done and what you've achieved. And I'm always happy to take your feedback. You guys have a wonderful evening and thank you for joining me. Now I need to go find Alan before he decides to play chopsticks again. And also I need to let Rioche out of her crate. There might be a little bit of an accident if I don't hurry up. Peace